Yesterday, but about design and microservices and some architecture and some code and some models and so this is different. This is about tools. Originally, this talk came out of a company who asked me if I could do a talk on agile tooling because they were starting to do agile and were wondering which tooling to buy. And I said to them, "So if you're just starting, why would you buy any tools already? Because you haven't got a clue to what you're using them. Will be using them for right." So first start doing this stuff and then later on see if you need any tools. That's basically the approach I would take. Um, but I'll show you through a number of misconceptions in the field, in the field of Agile that is, um, that needs to be taken care of, I think. So um, let me introduce myself first. Um, this is me. I'm, I'm, my name is Sonder. It's a difficult name in English. It, usually people say Hugendorn or something like And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, people usually add an S to my first name as well. I don't know why, but people just do that in, in the UK. And, uh, but it's without the S here. Um, in Dutch, by the way, because I'm from the Netherlands, it's pronounced Ochendorn. You won't be able to pronounce that anyway, so don't bother with it. So I am uh, basically a dad of three plus two, actually. This is a slightly older slide than the one I had yesterday. So I have three kids, my girlfriend has two, which makes us really, really busy. Um, so I got to do some programming on the side. I make some money out of that, and I do some training and coaching, and I'm an architect. And actually, I'm actually working now for an insurance company, which is my current assignment. And they sort of made me their CTO over the last half year, basically because I have the biggest mouth, and nobody else dared to, to stand up to the CEO of this insurance company. And I did, well, that's too fast. But basically, I work for Capgemini, which is a fairly large company. I think we employ around 140,000 people worldwide. So it's fairly big. Usually people ask me, oh, do you know anybody from, do you know him or her? I say, usually, uh, no, sorry about that. There's 140,000 of us, and that's a lot of people in the company. Um, my official function title there is a principal technology officer, which sits somewhere in between CTO and principal consultant. Basically, it means I don't manage any people, which is good, because if you would be managed by me, you would probably quit. Um, I'm not really good at that. I coach people, I don't manage people. They have to do that themselves. Um, and I'm also part of our Global Design Authority Agile, which basically means that's a group of people from around the world getting together every three months and talk about Agile and see if we can come up with something that Capgemini Global can use as an Agile approach, which is a bit beyond what you would expect from stuff like Scrum and maybe XP, um, because we do large projects of large clients. So basically, I've been there for 10 years and I've been doing really large projects. So my current project will probably last another five years. And you might say, oh, you get bored there. Well, I probably will. But because I am the CTO, I can change the technology overnight, right? So if I send them an email this afternoon, so I saw this really cool presentation about AngularJS this morning, and I'm already thinking about moving our client software to AngularJS, which we have already started, by the way. But, um, um, Chase talk was approved that we could actually do that. So that makes it fun and probably will be fun for the next five years. So this is my personal website. Um, this is my Twitter tag if you feel the need to tweet about this stuff. Um, so let's get on with this. Oh, I've written some books. You won't be able to read these because these two are in Dutch and this one is in German. It's quite similar. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it has a different title. Uh, in Germany, they say well, it's pronounced like Das kleine Arschloch which means something totally different. I won't translate that, but it's a horrible phrase. <laughs> so it also came out in English. Um, so it's available on Amazon, in both in the US and in the UK and in Canada, wherever you buy it. Um, I'll give you a discount code for it at the end of the session if you want to buy it. Um, and, well, that's basically the introduction, except that I have to say I write code. Um, and there's nothing I love more than writing code. So I'll tell this story. I told this one yesterday as well. So this is the doubler that we have. Um, uh, basically, I have been writing code since I was like, I think I was 14, but I got a Commodore 64. 
because she, most of you are too young to even remember or ever, even know what it is, but it was my first computer. And it had 32,000 bytes free to program it, right? So, and we could do that, actually. We could build nice programs and games in it and stuff. And so my previous project was at the Dutch Social Security Agency. And we were writing a big web application on top of their COBOL installations. And they have huge COBOL installations, like 100 million lines of code in there. And that's, it, it's enormous. So we're never going to get rid of it. So we said, oh, let's build some web application on top of it. Because the more modern users, basically, what they needed is more support. Because the old users, they were used to the character-based screens, right? And they, um, they, didn't, they know all the codes by heart. But the newer generation of users, they're probably over 45 as well, um, they didn't know all the codes, so they needed drop downs. Well, in a character based screen, it's very hard to, to program a drop down. It doesn't exist, right? So we created web applications just for this purpose. And that's a cool project. So I was doing some JavaScript um, to make sure that people wouldn't leave the page if they've already entered some data. So I was typing away some JavaScript, did some testing, and I was still working out how to figure it out, put some alerts on screen. When the project manager, in all his wisdom, um, I'll talk about project managers a bit later on. Um, decided to do a demo at the CEO of the Dutch Social Security Agency. And after an hour, he sent me an email with a screen grab in it. And he asked a question saying, are there any more of these pops up coming up? <laughs> so basically, that's my job, right? I write these little alerts that pop up on your web page. Uh, um, <laughs> so it, it's always fun looking at other people's code, right? There's always comments in, in, in like this and stuff. And it's always fun. So I love writing code, and I love doing it every day. So that's me. So let's first start. I'm not going to explain to you what Agile is, because I assume you already know. So I suppose all of you are in Agile projects, right? Who of you isn't? OK. Well, still a few. Well, this is not going to be an introduction into Agile. It's going to be bashing Agile a bit, because I have been doing Agile for quite a while now. And um, well, you learn a lot of stuff in doing Agile, a lot of the sense and nonsense of what Agile is. So let me start with this one. So a while ago, I tweeted this thing, saying, um, I just witnessed a 10 million euro classical waterfall software development project film. Misery, what's your feedback? So what do you think people said? So what do you think people replied to this one? Well, it's the answer you might expect, right? People said, well, basically, they should have never used waterfall anyway, because waterfall fails, right? We all know that waterfall fails. One of them said, does the name of the project coincidentally start with a C? So basically, if you're in a project which names start with a C, you're doomed. <laughs> I guess that is the case. Oh, um, so I named the project uh, starting with U, and so it's different. So anyway, so basically, if you do waterfall and your project fails, it's your own fault. You shouldn't have used waterfall. So it's basically the methodology that doesn't work, right? Waterfall doesn't work. We know that, right? That, that's the case. So what if you talk about Scrum, for instance? As an example of an Agile approach, there's lots of Agile approaches out there. I don't know, did, did you see um, Alan Holop's keynote yesterday? Yeah. Oh. I like the picture with the minions on it, right? And, and this is Scrum, and there's lots of others. And there is. So um, I tweeted this a few weeks after I tweeted the previous one. And I said, oh, I've heard about a Scrum project that spent 7 million euros, four and a half to be exact, and didn't deliver anything. And I said, Agile and Scrum. I said, what, is, what do you think now people reply? You think they replied the same as with the wonderful tweet? Like, the methodology doesn't work. <coughs> you shouldn't use Scrum. Or you probably shouldn't start with a C. <laughs> what people now reply is totally different. They reply stuff like this. <coughs> like, they didn't apply Scrum right. That is a big difference, right, between the conception of waterfall and what people think about Scrum. I think a lot of things about Scrum. But I'm not, not, not allowed to tell because I'm being taken. So, um, <laughs> and they said, well, this project like they did Scrum bot, which is the wrong way of doing Scrum. So it's apparently there's also a wrong way of doing Scrum, and it's even wrong now, so it's Scrum bot. So this is a totally different idea, right? So if a Scrum project fails, and they do, by the way, <coughs> so there's some stories about failing Scrum projects anyway. So if a Scrum project fails, it is not a methodology that doesn't work. It should do it wrong. <laughs> So if you're doing a Scrum project and it fails, and they do, it's fine. <coughs> what is the difference, right? So in one occasion, it's a methodology. And in the other occasion, it is never a methodology. Because Scrum never fails, right? Well, basically, if you read the Scrum Guide, which is 16 pages in all, 
It's very hard to fail by doing a project following these 60 pages because there's nothing in there. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do Scrum, because Scrum is a very good starting point. But that's basically it. It's a starting point, and not much more than that. Um, so one of the things I do at Capgemini is something we call a flying squad. What on earth is that? Well, basically, because we're a large company in like 36 or 40 countries, if a project somewhat fails, they phone head offices, which are in Paris, and they say, can we have a flying squad? And then they find some experts in the field that this project is running in, like SAP. Usually SAP projects go anyway, so. Um, but I don't do it. <laughs> um, well, it's basically because they're too big. And, and so, but if that's project projects fail somewhere in the world, like a Gemini, they phone me up and say, could you come over to, let's name some arbitrary location, Brussels. Well, I could drive it, by the way, so it would be a driving spot. But it could also be Hollywood. I once witnessed a failing Scrum project in Hollywood. That's cool, right? Uh, well, the project wasn't, actually. We lost a lot of money on that. But. So, so I see a lot of these failing agile projects. And it's usually because they just do Scrum. Basically, um, um, the project in Brussels that I was mentioning just now, I got there, I talked to the project manager, it had a project manager. Although, in the Scrum guide, the word project manager doesn't even appear in it. Yeah, the word project manager is not there. By the way, the word user story is also not in the Scrum guide. So if you think you have to do user stories in Scrum, you're wrong. You don't have to. You can do it, but you don't have to. And I talked to the project manager. I said, so, so what's wrong with this project? So usually flying spots interview people and you try to get the project back on the road. And he said, well, basically we're building this software for this client, and the client doesn't want to accept the software that we have built. And I said, um, why not? He said, by, by the way, I said, first, what's the client? He said, well, it's a nuclear power agency. <laughs> and we wrote software for that. It's like scary stuff, right? Um, and he said, well, basically, because there's no acceptance criteria. So there were no official criteria for the client to accept the software. So he could bash the software as long as he wanted. And they did. And I said, so why not? And he said, well, basically, because I'm Scrum Master. There we go. We'll talk about Scrum Masters in a second again. Um, um, the Scrum Master said, you don't have acceptance criteria in Scrum. So he didn't have any. So I said, where's your plan? This was a real project, right? Where they had a start and an end to it and a deadline and whatever they had. So they said, where's your plan? He said, we don't have a plan. I said, why not? He said, well, basically, the Scrum Master said, there is no project plan in Scrum. And there isn't. So they didn't have a plan. So the project filled basically. It cost us, I think, like 4 million euros or something. So a small, tiny project. Anyway, so let's move on. Here. So basically, agile projects will fail. So we've had the hype. The hype is behind us a few years ago. Um, and we're all doing agile projects. And you will see a rising number of agile projects fail. And there's a lot of reasons for that, by the way. Uh, um, if you want to know all of them, read my book. No, that's, <laughs> that's a fake question. <laughs> but you have to realize that Agile, nor Scrum, nor any of the other Agile approaches out there, is actually the silver bullet. There is no process out there that will solve your problems. So I've been doing these projects for like 15, 16 years already. And I haven't seen two that have exactly the same process. They do have a process. Some smaller, some bigger, depending on the client and the regulation and the need for documentation and how enterprisey they are and, or how flexible they are in building small clients or whatever they do. So it depends on the project. But there is no silver bullet out there. Waterfall wasn't one. None of the agile approaches are silver bullets as well. So if your Scrum projects fail and you think, oh, they're failing, we have to do something different, and you're reading about Kanban or Lean and you're jumping into Kanban, just to save your ass. Well, it might work, but it could also not work. Basically, well, Kanban is an agile process anyway, but people seem to move to the new fat just to get out of these failing projects. And there is no general approach that does that. So one of the reasons that these agile projects started failing <coughs> has to do with Scrum Masters. Who of you is a certified or, um, what's the other one, professional Scrum Master? Only two. That's good. Um, I'm not a fan of certification anyway. I don't have any certificates outside of my, my swimming diplomas. And that's about it, I guess. So 
The thing is, with certification, it's a scam. It's just a way for people to make money out of Scrum. Right? So they got together and thought, yeah, would you do certification? You know what? We'll make it, we'll lower our fences so anybody can do it. Basically, you take an hour to read the 16 pages of Scrum Guide. You take a multiple choice uh, questionnaire on the web. You pay a load of money and you're certified. And you are a master, right? Now, let me tell you about masters. Um, I'm not really sure if this is the best example, but anyway. So, let's assume you try to learn karate. Is anybody a few black belt in karate or some other jiu-jitsu or whatever? More or less, nobody? No, where are the people, right? We only <laughs> game on the computer or so. So basically, if you start doing this, well, if you're this, this young lad, you start by going to Mr. Miyagi. And Mr. Miyagi said, and he said, I want to learn how to do karate. And Mr. Miyagi says, what, so what is he saying? Do you know? Okay, well, that's the second exercise, actually. So the first exercise is, right? Right song, right song. I always forget whether it's this way or this way. I don't, it's probably going to the outside or, yes, yeah, okay. It is going to the outside. That's probably a better defense mechanism. So he spends the whole day washing this guy's car, right? And he thinks, what am, what am I learning? Well, basically what he's learning is that this has to be in your system, this particular move. Not really sure what it's good for, but nothing makes sense. I don't have a black belt in karate either. And then he goes back to Mr. Miyagi and says, so now will you teach me karate? And the old man says, go out and paint the fence. And he spends the whole day doing this. Right? He paints the fence. Again, it's a very low level exercise. But instead of, uh, only if, you do, if you're the karate kid, other than that, if you want to go to a black belt karate, become a real master, it takes you like 7 to 11 years to do that, right? <clears throat> so now let's get back to Scrum. <laughs> if you want to be a Scrum master, there's training courses for that because there's money to make out of training courses. Um, and I'll be happy to give you a Scrum training course if you want. Just pay me big loads of money and then I'll come over. And, anyway, so basically, there's, you take a two-day training course. If you even do that, right? You can just write, read the Scrum Guide, and you'll know enough about it just to do the, the, the exam, and you'll pass. So you have like zero experience, a certificate, and two days of training. People get in the field like that, right? If we hire new people at Gemini coming right out of school, they are sent to this particular certified, or I always forget what, which one, the, the, the least expensive one. So that's the, that's the CSM, right? Not the PSM. And um, they're sent to this course. Everybody's a scrum master. So in this previous project where I showed you the screen grab from, I had literally, I had five certified scrum masters in there. None of them had been in an agile project before. So none of them had any experience whatsoever in being an agile project. So those are the people uh, that go into projects to save the project, right? Those are the people that say, uh, what do you mean acceptance criteria? We don't have acceptance criteria in, in the scrum. Um, and they go off like this, right? So they, they're like, they go into the project, and the whole team thinks, oh, he's going to save our ass, right? And he's going to make all the decisions that we don't dare to make and whatsoever, and he's going to be our hero with two days of training and certificate and no experience whatsoever. And these people going into that field, so it's just one more metaphor. It's an interesting one. Is anybody here a certified party dive master? Nope, not again, okay, again, okay, you are. So how many years of training and experience does that take to become that? Uh, not much. Not much? No. Oh, that isn't good. No, that's what we have, yeah. So wait, wait, wait. Uh, to, to make the comparison to Scrum Mastery, it would mean that if I go out to get a diving course from a certified whatsoever party Scrum Master, um, it literally would mean that, well, if you are one, you would advise me how to go on the water without even having been on the water yourself. Suppose you spent a lot of hours on the water, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. And that's the difference. If you're a scrum master, you can be a scrum master without, without ever having been underwater, right? And that is one of the big issues in this field now. And there are so many of these scrum masters, certified scrum masters out there, without the experience. So I'm not saying the experienced guys are, are wrong. It's, it's just that there's a lot of inexperienced people in here. Uh, and they're treated like this, and that helps in training projects. So, what's next? There's something else that I have to, I have to talk about this. There's no way around it. So I'm a hardcore software developer, right? 
Agile and the Agile Manifesto and whatever was in there back then came out of software development, right? If you look at, um, well, I thought I had the Agile Manifesto up on the next slide. It, it's, if you read on top of the Agile Manifesto, it says, this is all about software development. And it is. And what you see over the years, and it grows and grows, are these Agile communities that don't have anything to do with software development anymore. They don't write code. At best, they try to improve the world or change the world or whatever they do. And if you go to Agile conferences these days, I don't suppose I have the... I had uh, on one of my decks earlier, uh, two weeks ago, I, I printed the whole agenda of an Agile conference in Belgium. If you look at the program, there were like uh, four or five parallel tracks for two days. There was only one talk that was about code. Only one. The rest of it was all stuff like this. Um, the stuff that I call kindergarten agile, it's like um, most of these, a lot of these agile books and blogs are written in dialogue form, as if we're unable to read it otherwise, right? Very usually, I'm going to help with the project visibility. What, what about, um, I hate this kind of stuff. It's just silly, <laughs> right? It's, I read children's books. Or, 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 well, uh, I, I, I stopped visiting agile conferences a while ago, but you, you get these strange quotes coming out of agile conferences. Just follow them on Twitter and see what comes out. These are literally tweets from people visiting an agile conference. What on earth does that mean? But make sure you don't miss the agile elephant versus the waterfall elephant in the lobby. <laughs> or, or this, this is one great, great one as well. This is the one from German Apple, I guess. But during this session, we are going to discuss the happiness index of projects. I, I hate, I, I purely and utterly hate this stuff. Like, add ready for celebration before the dunk column on your Kanban board. What the fuck? <laughs> this, this, this kind of conference should be made illegal, right? This has got anything to do anymore with something. You know? Or this one, this one's, this, this is, wow. If your retrospectives don't add value to your project, you should change your retrospectives. Um, that is a very, very good idea. Why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> this is crap. Or this one. Uh, oh, I hate this one. This, this is a guy speaking. I, I, I totally forgot his name. I made sure you couldn't recognize him. I really haven't got a clue who he was. But in his biography, at this point in time, he's like, so his name was here, so it's a short name. Oh, uh, yeah. Invented several unique techniques. Well, they're unique, yes. Influence mumble arts. Huh? <laughs> Influence maps. Supplication, exit and re-entry. Does that have to do with somebody about or some file? <laughs> the language of elegance. I hope it's a DSL. Um, did, he invented the interview. <laughs> Please, serial box. <laughs> what on earth does this have to do with somebody development? I don't know. Or why, why does everything have to be in Japanese, right? Can we just do it in plain English? Like a Gemba walk. You know what Gemba walk is? Oh, it's basically your manager dropping by and looking how you're doing. That's about it. Our manager does that every day because he's part of our stand-up meeting anyway. So, so basically we have a daily Gemba walk. Right? <laughs> Crap. Or everything has to be game these days, right? There's not, there's not a single Agile conference that does not use tons of Lego blocks. It's sort of mandatory to have Lego blocks, right? Um, no, I'm not, I'm not, I love Lego, by the way, but... Uh, Except for Americans, they call it Legos. I don't know why. Why, why do you use a plural for that? I mean, I'm not a clue. <laughs> but everything has to be in gamification. Well, I, I love games, but I do want to write my code at the end of the day, right? <clears throat> it's not that I can spend the whole day doing gamification and improvement and, uh, 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 or hiring a psychotherapist just to make sure people can do their work right. We, we, by the way, we have that. Um, yeah, so. so <laughs> there it is, the manifesto for Agile. Oh, what is it? The Agile software development, right? It's about writing working software. That's why we're in this field, right? Not to do influence mumble apps or whatever you do, or create a happiness index. <laughs> I hate that. So now we're moving into the tool stuff. So I bashed a bit on Agile and the Agile communities. That's all good. Uh, still, Agile is quite good, right? I use it every day, and I use the techniques and the principles and the discipline. So what about tools? As people ask me about tools almost every day. So what tools should we use? What is the best tool for <coughs> A, B, C, D, or whatever we do? And the, the quick answer is, so I'll give you the quick answer so you can go to another talk. The quick answer, there is no ideal tool for your project. 
or for all your project, basically, because there's probably a best fitting tool for your project. And it's usually cheaper and easier than you might think. So, again, um, well, the Agile Manifesto basically says individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Now, there's a lot of different ways of interpreting this. Um, one of them is, um, oh, um, uh, it has to be about individuals and interactions, and you cannot do processes and tools anymore. And I've literally had this discussion, basically with certified scrum masters. But they said, no, no, you cannot do processes and you cannot have tools. What do you mean you cannot have tools? This is a software development project. Have you ever seen a developer without a tool? Uh, even Notepad is a tool, right? So even VR or whatever you might use, or, you, have you have to have tools, right? There's no way you can do software development without tools. And there's loads of them, actually. So, and the same goes for this one. People say, oh, you cannot have documentation in an agile <laughs> project. Yes, you can, as much as you need. Nothing more than that, but as much as you need, right? And that's different from project to project. So, um, again, a quote from Jürgen. Um, have you heard of Jürgen Upload? He wrote a great book called Management 3.0, well, very book, it's very thick book, actually. Um, and he, he's had the same question, so he tweeted about it. He said, well, funny people keep asking, what tools do you use for drawings? Just as an example, right, for drawings. Well, you should have been here at, at Simon's talk earlier on, you probably were. But um, well, you get so many questions about these, these, what are the best tools, that it's almost annoying. So I decided to create this talk. So, basically it starts with saying, there is no one size fits all agile. It doesn't exist. It's different for your project, for your project, for your project, for my project. I work at an insurance company. They have to deal with a lot of regulations, so they need a bit of more documentation than you might say if you would build, I don't know, a mobile website for uh, uh, reviewing uh, restaurants or whatever you might do. So it has a bit different architecture, a bit different needs. Um, so you could say it's sliding scale. If you have small projects with low complexity, you don't need a lot of ceremony added to it. But in my case, uh, being in, in an insurance company, I'm probably more high up on the scale because we do have tools to deal with requirements. We do have UML modeling tools. And we do have to have an online dashboard because we're a distributed project. So we have to uh, have some more ceremony. So the question would be, what tools do you recommend? So my question usually is that, so what tools do you want me to recommend? <laughs> That's the easy one. I, I get hired to ask stupid questions. Right? So the question I ask most is why? Start asking the question why a lot, right? That's good. So basically I have to say it depends. But that's a typical scrum answer, right? So it depends. Um, so what do you do when A, B, or C? Oh, it depends. It's the best answer you can get here as a scrum master. Uh, they probably teach you. Um, in one of the scrum master courses that we had in the Netherlands, people actually learned how to rip off a post-it from a blog. Hmm. <laughs> that's very true, yeah. So you know that? How to do that? It's in my book, How to Do That, by the way. It's just wrote it down as an anecdote. If you have a post-it block and you have the, 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 the glue piece on, I don't know what it's called in English, but the, the glue on top of it, right? What people usually do, they rip it off from bottom to top, right? And if you do that, um, the, the line of glue will curl around, which means it fall off, the, the thing will fall off your wall or your whatever you put it on within a few days. But if you rip it off, again, the glue line is here, from left to right, it doesn't happen. So they, they stick longer. That's good, right? I've learned that from a scrum master who went to a scrum master training where they actually told me. <laughs> yeah, it happens. So what are tools? So basically, the first thing you'd have to say, it is not the tool that does the job. It is you who does the job. So no matter what tool you're using, it doesn't really matter. Actually, well, it does matter a bit, but it, it, it's, it will never get the job done. There is no tool in the world out there that does that. No code generation tools, no development tools, no continuous delivery tools, whatever you might have, that will actually do the job for you. You don't have to do a lot of work, and especially a lot of thinking. So when I started at my current client, they were using Eclipse. It's a Java shop. They used Eclipse. And some developers came in and said, oh, no, you should never use Eclipse. You should use IntelliJ. And basically, developers said, well, so they got into a battle between IntelliJ and Eclipse, and they decided that you could use either one of them. Just the one that fits you best. And over time, by the way, there's, now, there's only two people who still use Eclipse. And the rest of them moved on to IntelliJ. For me, that was good, because I, I come out of a, a, 
um, um, I did Microsoft development for, uh, for almost a, uh, for over a decade. And with Visual Studio, we use ReSharper, right? ReSharper is the best, well, if I could recommend one tool, I would recommend ReSharper. And the funny thing is, IntelliJ, also coming from JetBrains, has the same shortcuts. So I, I switched on IntelliJ with these other guys coming from Eclipse. And I was like, <laughs> and they were like, how do you know? You haven't done Java in like a decade. So yeah, well, it's, well I know the shortcuts, basically. <laughs> Control Shift M still works and everything. It's, yeah, so they did a good job. So anyway, so developers have to have tools. In my opinion, I don't really care whether you use tool A, B, or C. In Java, it's usually either Eclipse or IntelliJ, and there's a few tiny others. If you do .NET development, it is usually uh, Visual Studio, um, and if you do JavaScript, well, who cares? Uh, anyway, so not most people would use Sublime or some other text editor, and that's good. Um, I love Sublime, or Notepad++, stuff like that. But you have to have some tools. There's no developer out there that doesn't use tools. Um, but again, even if you have a big tool, you can still write crap with it, right? And I've seen so many, I've done so many code reviews in my career that, oh, you see so much crap out there, so much really bad written code, right? And uh, um, it's always fun to look at, by the way, but again, if you, even if you have a good tool, you can still make quite a mess out of it. So, um, it's basically, I, and I haven't got a clue to why I put this up anymore. I was looking at my slide this morning. <coughs> I, I couldn't figure out why I put in here, let's play next week. So I'm still puzzled about that, so I'll skip the slide. <laughs> Sorry about that. If it comes back to mind, or if you have an idea why I put up that slide, please let me know. So if you look at tooling, there's, there's a lot of tooling that you might have on your project. Literally a lot. Like, um, well, you need to write code, right? You need to have a tool to write the code in. And if you've written code, you need to put your code somewhere in a repository, so you have to have a version control system. Or you could do without. I tried once on a project. Because uh, I, I, I always have trouble with my version control and checking in and checking out, especially when it's given. You have to do sort of a two-phase commit to get your code somewhere. And, um, I always get into trouble. And uh, at one point in time, my coworkers decided that I was not allowed to check in any code anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but basically because I was writing the frameworks and, and it changed every time. And they had written some web pages and then bang, they broke down. And, well, so they cut me out of the project. Anyway, so you have to have some version control. People use issue tracking tools. I have an opinion on that, but I'll get back to that when we talk about Jira anyway. And then you have continuous integration and continuous deployment tooling, etc., etc. There's lots of different tools for that. Um, tools for unit testing, um, uh, tools for time tracking even. People track, track time. I hate that. So basically, I, ho I hope nobody's watching from the company I work for because I'm the only one delivering in the whole building that doesn't check into the time system in the morning and check out in, in the evening. Because I, I just don't do it. It's just, I refuse to do that. Um, they will have to uh, fire me before I start doing that, I guess. Um, and lots of people use different dash dashboards, and I'll show you a few of them. Uh, uh, and, and people use burn down charts, sort of like a fake way to think that you're actually planning something. But I'll get back to that when we talk about project managers. Who of you is a project manager by the way? Oh, goody, goody, there's only one. <laughs> We can make fun of project managers then. Um, tools for deployment, code quality tools. Who's it, uh, just, just show me, who's of you is using Sonar, for instance? So the rest of you is doing .NET. <laughs> but you can use Sonar and .NET as well, right? Nobody does Java these days anymore. No? That's good. We're the only ones in the Netherlands, I guess. So. Um, refactoring tools, like the ReSharper is a very good refactoring tool, stuff like that. Repositories, what if you start doing DevOps? Well, we're not there yet, so I don't really know. Management reporting. You know how the project manager in my team reports out to management? He creates an Excel spreadsheet with traffic lights in it. That's really neat, right? It's, uh, it's, the only thing is, I always, I always print it in black and white. And I, couldn't, I couldn't tell the difference, right? Whether it's red or green, actually. So. Now he puts on these smiley faces. That's better. Um, the CEO loves that. <laughs> anyway, so stuff about prioritizing. How do you prioritize your work items on the backlog, etc.? Et how do you do estimates? There's tools for that, actually. At Capgemini, we are very fond of those tools. We actually created tools to do estimation. <coughs> They're not really accurate, but it, it gives you a more accurate feeling to do that, right? Um, 
Uh, nobody from Kajemai heard this, right? Anybody, if you're working for Kajemai, just, 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 just protect myself a little bit. Um, uh, distributed communication, video conferencing, uh, uh, lots of projects we have in the company are really distributed projects. So there was a project that I was witnessing, uh, it also failed, by the way, um, that had, uh, let me imagine it right. So the client was in Dubai and in New York, oh, in Singapore and New York. The test team was in Stockholm. The development team was in Wroclaw in Poland, and the requirements people were in Germany somewhere. But that was the, the, the project setup, right? And that was quite complex, and they used a lot of uh, uh, video chats and Google Hangouts and stuff like to, to be able to even communicate with each other. And that makes a project really, really hard. Because basically, the bigger the distance gets, the harder it is to communicate. And that starts already with if you're not sitting in the same room. So the best thing is always to sit in the same room. We call that co-location, right? Um, and even if you are in the next room, it already gets more difficult. My current team is sitting in three different rooms, basically on the same corridor, or just around the corner, actually. And it is already hard. If I'm in flow as a developer, I'm writing code, usually in pairs. Um, not mandatory, but we do that a lot. And I write some code, and in the middle of writing something, we thinking, OK, we should ask this to the analyst who analyzed this stuff together with the client. And, and we think, like, crap, we have to literally get out of flow, walk to the next room, ask him the question, taking him out of his flow, then walk back, get back in flow again, and start talking again. So getting into flow if you're a developer, um, me, I'm, I'm, it usually takes me about five to 10 minutes to get back in flow and start typing again. Right? So that's, it's not only the time you need to ask a question, it's the time to get back to where you were that actually makes this really expensive. So what about if they're on a different floor in the same building, or in a different building in the same city, or in different cities, or even worse in different countries? It makes communication harder and harder and harder, which means you have to rely on much more tooling to be able to facilitate that. So yes, there is tooling in Agile projects. Um, so I'm gonna show you a bit about the tooling that we just use in our, in our project. It's just a collection of tools. I'm not saying this is the right collection, and it isn't actually, because what we see, and that's the mo most important part about our tooling landscape, is that it changes all the time. I'm going to show you a bit of these changes, actually. Um, so this is basically a setup. I took this sort of uh, snapshot of our tool set uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and it's, uh, we use IntelliJ. People want to use Jira. And there's other people in the project that say, no, we, we don't want to use Jira. Um, we use subversion for version control. I actually wanted to move the code out into the cloud, into Git. But this is an insurance company. They don't want to do that. They just want to keep it in-house and on-premises. And okay, I'm good with that. We use Jenkins and Maven to do build stuff and whatever. I'm, I'm not very fond of Jenkins, actually. Just basically because the UI looks horrible. I'm a UI guy. But, and so, so Jenkins UI is horrible. I would probably prefer Team City. So we're testing that out. That is probably one of the changes we're going to make to this landscape. Basically because it's, it's a little bit easier to create a deployment pipeline um, and hook them all together in, uh, in Team City. Um, but there's other stuff out there as well. So um, we started, of course, using JUnit and some attached frameworks like PowerMock and um, whatever have you. In, in, well, lots of these mocking frameworks out there. I can, I can, if it comes down to Unit, I have a lot of discussion with my developers. My developers say, we have to test everything. And they mock out everything except a single line of code. <laughs> and they really test whether that code has, a, has been executed. To me, that's a bit too low level. Um, so we're, we're trying to decide on what to unit test and what not. So basically, if you mock out everything, there's nothing left to test. Right? You, you test individual lines of code. That's a lot of work. And if your code changes, you have to rewrite your test over and over again. And I'm not really sure yet. But we are starting to figure it out. Whether that's actually worthwhile. Whether it would be better just not to mock everything out, but to have this code really execute. And then maybe even store something in the database and then later pull it out again, or uh, um, um, roll back your transaction, or whatever you do, to make sure something real happens in your code if you're testing it. To me, that looks a bit better. So we're testing at a slightly higher level now. The developers still don't like it, but I have this, because. We, we stopped a couple of sprints ago, and people said, we have this huge um, um, technical debt 
which is a terrible phrase, because we haven't unit tested everything. We have a very low percentage of code coverage. And I was like, so what is it? They said, well, like 36. I said, so what does that mean? It means that 64% of our code is not uh, 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 touched by this unit test. I said, so what does that mean? What does that tell you about the quality of your code? Well, basically nothing, actually. I'll tell you one other story. I was like looking at a code base that came out of uh, our colleagues in India. So it doesn't have to do with India. It's just this, this was a silly, silly anecdote. I mean. And it was a horrible code base. The code was really, written really, really badly. In C sharp, by the way, and they did uh, well. I'm not going to tell you about the code because it was too horrible. Otherwise, I'll be here the rest of the afternoon talking about this piece of code. And, and they said, no, 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 it's not that bad because out of the test come that they had 100% code coverage. I was like, OK, that's impressive. How come you have 100% code coverage and you've written such crappy code? So I started looking at the unit tests. And they basically touched on all the code in the unit test, but they didn't have a single assert in there. <laughs> so everything passed, right? They had 100% code coverage. They didn't just, just that they didn't test anything. That's all. Basically. So, so it, it's not always adding value. And then one of the analysts on my team said, we want to use fitness. Have you used fitness? Fitness is an interesting concept. It's basically a wiki where you can edit your test in sort of plain text. And you have to write some code, a fixture, to make sure that this actually, in a wiki written code, and there's some standards in there saying that if you put it down like this, if you put it in a table like this, that means the outcome will be exactly like um, the objects will be like a table, etc., etc. So it, it looks nice. Um, and, and you can actually run the test from the wiki. Um, you have to build some pictures, basically in Java or C Sharp or whatever you do. Um, but testers, and, and, and I have to explain maybe a bit about testers. Testers in most of my projects, they're not developers. They're people with experience in the testing field, which is something totally different from what developers do, right? Um, and, and they could actually add the test in the wiki themselves and run the test from the wiki. It's just that the developer had to write some features to be able to do that. Um, and then we started using fitness for everything because the analyst who promoted it, he was promoting it even further. Uh, basically because we're doing a microservice architecture, they started testing um, the REST calls as well. So the funny thing with these REST calls that we did is that do you run, do you run, I have to take a sip of water. So the URLs, are basically fairly simple. But what comes back for most of these services is a very complex JSON structure. And then the JSON structure comes back into the wiki, and they have to test for values in that structure. And they started doing that, and they seemed to be really happy with it, until one of the services actually changed. And that meant they had to go through the whole JSON structure that they were expecting back, and change that everywhere and everywhere. And that sort of, they lost attention on that one. So now we're thinking of moving to SOAP UI, which is probably the slightly better way of dealing with this. And you can run your test automated from SOAP UI in the build as well. Um, so, so that's one of the changes we have in our landscape. Um, time tracking, well, they have their own custom application. Here you go. When, when you log in, um, uh, an Internet Explorer browser pops up, and you have to click a button, and then you're checked in. And now you just click away the browser. Okay. So we use uh, uh, also a custom tool called Speedware 9 for doing dashboards and stuff like that. Um, and we use Sonar for code quality. Actually, I'm trying to switch it up because it's, people spend too much time on improving the quality of the code. And the code is quite OK already. So please move on and write some real code, stuff like that. So I, I wanted to move into Git. Uh, it's an insurance company. They're not going to do it. They're never going to do it. So I might uh, um, try Bitbucket for change because it's sort of more private mode into uh, having Git repository in place. Mm -hmm. um, they want to move into uh, DevOps. I talked about this a little bit yesterday. And, uh, that's basically still wishful thinking. We are going to, that's one of the tools. One of the tools we have is that we have an empty building. So this insurance company has, uh, has three buildings. And the whole company is based in one of these buildings. And it just had these other ones built in the hope that they could rent these to other people and other companies. It doesn't happen, right? So there's many empty offices in the Netherlands. So they have this empty building, and I said, you know what? I'm, what I want to do, actually, is move the, the whole team, we're like 32 people grown to 40, into this single floor, and also have 
the application management department people, it's about 60 to 70 of them, in the same room with us. We're not dealing with them every day yet, but as soon as our microservices are going to hit acceptance and UAT and, and, um, uh, and are in production, we will have to deal with these people every day. And they will have to deal with us. That's even worse, I guess. Um, so I want to have them all on the same floor. So one of the basic tools that we have is I'm going to put them all on the same floor. Hopefully, they will start communicating with one another. I'm not really sure that they will do that, but um, they, because they haven't done it for like over six years, right? So the, the application management people are now on floor one. We're on floor two. They don't talk to each other, even at lunch. They don't lunch with each other. It's like two very different departments not talking to each other and doing the same thing. So for dashboarding and prioritization, there is a company called 3M that has some magnificent tools for that. They're really cheap. And um, <laughs> well, I'll show you some pictures of that. It's, we use Post-its for basically everything in the kitchen sink. I love Post-its. Uh, I always have this discussion with my son uh, about what is the most useful invention ever. Um, and I'm going for post it and he goes for duct tape. And the funny thing is, where is duct tape from? Well, it's from 3M again. <laughs> That's a cool company, right? So do they also build software at 3M? I don't know. So um, we use some estimation technique, but it's fairly rough. And the thing with this estimation is that we have a project manager on the team. Do you have project managers on your agile projects? Why? Basically because they are available in the company, right? They're there. They have to do something. <laughs> yeah, it's going to create a report, right? That's exactly what they do. Uh, i tell you one thing. I got a picture yesterday um, when I was sitting in one of the talks from uh, one of the testers in my team that the project manager had hung up some posters uh, with each of the teams. Uh, and it says the project is called um, um, UPK. And it says the Ten Commandments in UPK. So he wrote down Ten Commandments. And he printed it out and put it all in work. Like, thou shalt not do whatever, stuff like that. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, that's all project managers do, by the way. But our project manager, we said, I, I'm part of the steering committee. I don't want to be. I hate meetings like that. But anyway, I, I'm in the steering committee. So last Monday, he came up with a spreadsheet. Um, and it said, oh, this and this piece of software, the deadline is uh, January 1st, 2015. And I'm like, how do you know? I, I, he said, well, that's the deadline. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you think we'll be able to finish the software on that date, right? He said, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm expecting that. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you know we can do that? Um, he said, no, 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 it doesn't matter. It has to be done by then. <laughs> and I'm like, so what if it isn't? And he said, well, it has to be done by then. <laughs> and I said again, so what if it isn't? And well, there's not much you can do. I mean, you can size up your team or create more teams better. Um, we've done both exercises. We, have, we started off as one team, and it grew to 30 people, and it became too big. Actually, the stand-up meeting in the morning <laughs> was growing and growing. It took longer and longer uh, until a point that we said, well, this is probably not the best way to work together. So we are continuously changing the setup of the teams. We literally changed it a couple of weeks ago from one team of 30 people to four small teams. 30 people doesn't have right? There are teams of like six to seven people, including the product owner. And we now have four teams. And what I see now is that there's a really big difference between the setup we had a couple of weeks ago and the setup we have now, is that the people in the teams, we have a business analyst in each of the teams. You might wonder, is there a business analyst in agile projects? Well, there is in ours just because they have to, right? And they have to do work, too. Um, if, when I looked at these people, they, they weren't, uh, there was no full-time job for them, but they were employed full-time, right? So they literally spent half of their days just browsing the internet, which is really good, because uh, uh, basically, my son's phone broke down. So I went to one of these analysts and said, could you please look up how we can repair this? And he looked it up, and he even ordered the parts and repaired my phone while sitting at his desk at the time, right? I'm very grateful for that, by the way. That's not really the job you should have. The funny thing is, when we changed it to working with smaller teams, what I literally saw is that he was working with one of the developers, a female developer, by the way. So it adds to the, I don't know what it's called anymore. Uh, Neil talked about it It adds uh, to the general intelligence, right? To have women. What, what did Neil say yesterday? Uh, you weren't at Neil's keynote? 
Ah, you should have been there. It's about uh, raising the, the overall intelligence of the team if there's women on the team. I have four on my team. Which is good. So we're a very intelligent team, I guess. So what you see is that this analyst is actually working together really closely with two of the developers. And they're actually now literally working with three of them um, for the whole day. So he's now, for the first time in years actually, he's been fully active the whole day. And he actually came up to me said, at the end of the day, he said, oh God, I'm really tired. <laughs> I said to him, that must be a really new experience, right? <laughs> So, um, I know we said, okay, for work items and managing work items and, and creating work items and requirements, we use a UML tool. Yes, we do. UML is still good for doing requirements and uh, domain driven design and stuff like that. You don't have to use it for architecture. Otherwise, Simon, who was here just before me, will get angry with me if I say that. <coughs> you don't have to use it for architecture, but it's really good for domain driven design and it's really good for modeling use cases and stuff like that. And state chart diagrams if you feel the need to do that. So, we, yes, we do use it because they need a lot of documentation on this particular client. And we didn't want to put it in a bunch of Word documents because they get as inconsistent as they can be. And they can be really, really horrible. And we use a wiki um, basically for all of the other documentation. So if you look at the architecture, um, it started off with me creating a presentation on architecture. I gave it to one of the guys on the team. So please put it on a wiki and elaborate on it. So they started elaborating on it. And every time we come up with something new, that we should add to the architecture. We just add it and we write some few lines on the wiki and it's there. And it's there for everybody to see. That doesn't mean that everybody reads it. Um, in my experience, wikis are a very nice way of adding stuff to it. But the problem is nobody reads it. Um, that, that is my personal experience with wikis. And, and uh, uh, we have loads of interesting stuff on that. You could probably fill a good book on software architecture with what's now on the, on the wiki there. But half of the team hasn't even read it. So there's other ways you have to use to convey your software architecture to your teams, or to talk about different decisions that you made in building up frameworks. And we do that all the time. We take every week, we take an hour, usually on Friday afternoon, with the developers, basically, sit down and see what we have changed over the week uh, on our frameworks. Because it's, it's growing and growing, right? We write our own UI frameworks on top of the existing ones. We write stuff to be able to use REST and services and stuff like that. And it adds up, right? So with the whole bunch of developers that we have, like 10 or 12, I don't know how if they're all there, uh, we do this weekly meeting where we sort of interact with each other. So uh, we've changed this. Oh, oh, that means we should probably change that as well. Yes, yes, you should. Because you need to be able to convey that to your whole team if your team is bigger than that. And a wiki, it works to write it down, so you have it documented, but it doesn't work for conveying your knowledge and what you do to other people. So here's the wiki. I have some screen grabs here. Um, so here's the wiki in my current project. Here's how we do use case modeling. Um, I talked about this a bit yesterday. So every little oval here is a use case that gets implemented into a class in our systems uh, and in our, uh, um, uh, our components as well. Um, so and then we write down the use cases in a stepwise approach. So these are called structured scenarios. So you have the scenarios and you have the alternative flows here, um, and it helps us to, to keep up with the requirements. This is basically how we deal with requirements. It's very brief, but we do these requirement sessions where we actually write these uh, scenarios um, in, in design sessions with the tester, the developer, the business analyst, and the product owner, who isn't a real client, by the way. Um, uh, in my team, actually, it's the CEO of the insurance company. Which is really interesting, by the way, because um, we had this design session and well, some, some people said, well, we still have this product somewhere that I think there's like 50 people having this insurance policy. Um, and it's a horrible product to have automated. And we, we have difficult, there's exceptions everywhere, right? It's a stupid product. And then the CEO of this company was in the design session. And he said, well, what, what if we decided that we, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna sell this product anymore? And I said, well, yeah, yeah, that, that might, really might be a good idea. He said, okay, done. <laughs> it was done. That was cool, right? Um, so he gets to make a lot of the decisions, and that's good. So here's our uh, here's our free uh, tracking device. It's here, right? <laughs> we put a lot of brown paper on the wall because we're not allowed to put anything on the wall, so we put it on brown paper and put the brown paper on the wall. That was good. I don't know what's the difference anyway. Uh, so we have uh, uh, different colors of post-its for different types of things, right? 
the, 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 the orange ones are usually stuff that ends up in, on the wiki because it's architectural stuff. We have purple ones for technical stuff. We have yellow ones for use cases, and we have green ones for additional features. And the light blue ones, maybe I've got a picture of that somewhere. Else. Probably should. Have. And the blue ones are actually, um, they have the names of the people in the team on there. So I said, I'm working on this one because it's not magnetic, so we kind of put up uh, magnets for that. And uh, this is the way we turn our process. It works. It works really great. Except for the project manager. Who uses this one? This is Speedboot 9, which is actually a tool my team and I built a, a while ago because we were doing distributed projects. And 10 years ago, we couldn't find any other tools that actually did the same on the internet. So we built this one. Uh, by the way, uh, it, it's free and it's open. You can actually create an account on www.speedboot9.com and just start using it or whatever. So the project manager uses this one, which is an electronic version of this one, actually. It's exactly the same. And that's part of its job to keep. This one up every day. So <laughs> as soon as he moves something here at the stand up meeting, he's like, oh, which one moved? Which one moved? And he then moves it here to the next call. <laughs> and you might question, why are you doing this? Well, basically, electronic dashboards, and this is just an example of that, um, are an interesting way of keeping track of where you are in the project, right? It helps you keep track of your burn down charge or your burn down charge or whatever you use, um, although they're never quite accurate, but it, it helps to track that. And the thing is, with the paper version, it doesn't track anything. So if you want to track something, check out tools that actually do that a bit. And, but make sure that it's only the project manager who changes stuff, because it's, uh, for the rest of the team, it doesn't have color. Right? There's another use of an electronic dashboard, is that eventually, if your post-its are on the board long enough, they will fall off. <laughs> and that's a big difference with the electronic boards like this one. It doesn't fall off, right? It's just staying there. Uh, until a, a lot of the application crashes or whatever it does, right? So um, you can have things like this, burnout charts, and if you look at the Agile uh, dashboards that are out there, they're all doing this, right? Um, and I'm a bit of, uh, a lot of projects use, who, who of you is using a burndown chart or burndown charts? Mm, okay. We tend to use burnout charts. <coughs> There's a slight difference in there. And if you want to read more detail, read my book, that's nah. I should stop saying, oh, I'm not allowed to walk out of this stupid boundary here. Um, anyway, so uh, the difference between a burn down chart and a burn up chart is in a burn down chart, um, um, you start here and you go down to zero, right? And as soon as you pass the, 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 the ground line, uh, the project is done. That's basically the idea of a burn down chart. The problem with that is it is not really clear how much change you have in the scope of your project. If you do the other way around, saying, okay, I'm just going to add up the points that we've earned. And I'm also going to add up the points that make up our total scope. <coughs> and what you see here is probably we're here in the project, is that the scope is growing and growing. And if you do it like this, it's much more visible uh, uh, how much your scope change is. I think this for a project that have um, that ran for like three years and had like um, I don't know, 125 iterations, two-week iterations, something like that. And we followed the scope change throughout the project in a single burn-up chart. And it was really interesting to see, because you, you can literally see the scope going like this. And in a burn-down chart, you don't see that, because you're going towards the zero line. So I prefer burn-up charts to burn-down charts. And you can have other graphs, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, interesting stuff, right? And we use, of course, a development tool. We also use a code generation tool. So I have discussions that people say, no, you're not allowed to do code generation or model driven whatever you do um, on an agile project. I don't, Why not? Well, because it's not there. It says uh, individuals, interactions, or processes, and tools. Yes, but this saves time, right? And it helps improve the quality of our code. Uh, by the way, we're stupid. We build our own code generator. It's called Tobago. It's free. Uh, um, it reads the UML model and spits out code using your own templates, basic, basic stuff. But it helps to sort of keep up the repetitive work and keep up uh, the, uh, um, the quality of the code. And especially if you're start changing, uh, 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 let's say your base classes in your code, it, it's very handy to say, okay, I've got this domain model of over 50 classes, let's regenerate the code, and we're done, right? And that helps with that kind of change. Not saying you have to, but it's a nice addition too. Um, so fitness, this is a, a, a screen grab of fitness, what you see here, is actually a test, uh, uh, and you set it up like this. So this particular uh, uh, piece of code, the fixture that is underneath here, it takes in a bunch of parameters, uh, and this is what you expect from it. And it's actually reading 
Um, uh, Fitness is actually reading this set, set up and uh, uh, basic output and it reads the columns in the tables to make sure that that is exactly what comes out. So in this case, out comes a whole bunch of stuff, uh, uh, a collection of, of whatever it is. Um, oh, it's payments here. A collection of payments uh, um, um, for an insurance policy. Um, and it is a, you can actually run this. I'm not sure if I have, yeah, I have a screen grab of this. And it says, well, okay, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and here is something missing, right? Here's the date missing from the actual result that comes out of the fiction. And you can use this in, in test sets uh, and in, and in um, groups of test sets, and, um, and it's really nice. But it's, uh, it's elaborate. Um, so we only use it for testing real code, not use it for testing services and JSON objects that pop back, etc., etc. We, we start doing it. So here the tests are all passed, right? This is a level up. Uh, so it has a lot of services and stuff that it tests. And there's 48 tests that go right, uh, 48 and 21 and 24. We ignored five, and there's zero exceptions, no warnings, whatever. But this is good, right? And you can run these every time you take it, you run a build, etc. So fitness is an interesting tool for testing code at some higher level. It's not really good for testing uh, um, results of services where you have huge JSON objects coming back. Um, you can also use it, by the way, to test um, test UI, test web applications. You can actually sort of program down. So if I, if I put in this value in that field, this value in that field, I press that button, I must come this result. Testers can actually do that. The only requirement is that the, the controls on your UI and your web pages have to have specific IDs that you can refer to. Now, if you're using a server-side technology such as JSP, or in our case, JSF, or ASP web forms, or whatever you do, it generates the IDs for you, right? And they're different from what you might expect. So the client ID is not the same as the ID you have on the server side. So you have to figure out what the client ID is. But because they're generated, if you add another control in between, these client-side IDs change. So you have to figure out a way to create your own client-side ideas using some tag that you might add to your HTML uh, to be able to supply uh, UI testing with fitness. So um, um, they started using Jira. So I had this interesting uh, uh, conversation about Jira with my client. <coughs> the thing is the following. Um, one of the big issues we have at this client is that the product owners are powerful people in the organization. It's not only the CEO of the company, it's also um, the manager of the IT department. She used to be an insurance so she knows a lot about insurance, probably most in the whole building. Um, but the thing is also, they know so much about it that as soon as we created some requirements in the design system and want to start building it, as soon as we build it, the same day usually, they look at it and they say, oh no, wait, we forgot this and this and this. That is quite normal in agile project, right? It happens every day. But the thing is, they keep on doing that. So at one point in time, we delivered seven web pages in a wizard. And they looked at the wizard and they said, ah, oh, we actually want it in five steps. Right? And that is troublesome. So we now said to them, you know what, as soon as we agreed on something during a design session, we're going to build it first. And then we're going to move it through the chain to the accepted stage, which takes usually a couple of days or two days, or depending on the size of it. And only after that will we allow changes on it. Basically because to, to limit a little bit of this change, because the change is, is so big on the project that we never finish anything. And I want to get stuff out of the door, right? So we said basically, well, um, only until, it's, until you've accepted it, we're not going to change the requirements. You can add requirements to it, but we'll put it on a separate post. Now, the analyst, one of the analysts in my team says, we shouldn't put them on posters. We should put them on Jira. Um, my experience with Jira is, is that it's really good um, as a tool to manage changes on stuff that's already in production. I like it for that. It's good. Because it keeps a sort of notebook of everything that we change on stuff that's in production. But I think. Um, that before it goes into acceptance or, or, or actually to done, you shouldn't do stuff in Jira. Because I'll give you an example of what happened in my project. We did that for a while, and I looked at it and I said, well, this is not the way we should do this. So after we build stuff, we test it right away. So the tester comes in, looks at the web page, fills in the test cases that he created, and there's usually something wrong. Now what happened at some point in time, he said, okay, there's something wrong. 
It is my job to report that it's wrong. I'm putting it in Jira. So he writes down, he creates an issue in Jira, put a number on it. Um, and then uh, um, the issue goes to the developer. The developer looks at Jira, and I said, oh yeah, there's something wrong with it, I'll probably change it. You might think that's an interesting procedure, right? It's probably a good procedure if the tester is, for instance, in the Netherlands, and the developer is, I don't know where, in Morocco or something, right? Then this would be an interesting procedure. But the thing is, the tester and the developer I'm talking about are sitting back to back to each other. <coughs> so I said to him, hey, I, I, I said, I'm, I now forbid you to use Jira for this. Not until the work hand is actually done. After that, when we usually don't touch it anymore, if something's wrong, note it down in Jira, and we might pick it up in the next iteration. So we slowly started using it, but I'm not really fully happy with it yet. Um, so it does a lot of things and follows up the issues, etc., etc. And uh, uh, of course, we built UI stuff. Um, we use Bootstrap for that. I love Bootstrap. If you're not having a UI framework yet, please look at Bootstrap. Um, it's, a, it's open source. It's made by Twitter, um, and it's a very easy way of getting your UI out. And there's lots of stuff on top of it. There's lots of additional stuff you can use, but I'm not going to talk about Bootstrap. Uh, one more. These are actually screen grabs of the applications that we're building. Looks nice, right? Very basic stuff, not that but fancy stuff. And now the product owners want it to be more fancy. And I said, why? They said, well, it has to look more fancy. I said, you are building this for your own employees who are sitting here in the building. We never get outside anyway. So uh, um, why do you want to make it more fancy? I said, yeah, yeah, because we're going to use this for the end users as well, who are people requesting insurances or, uh, uh, um, uh, well, just uh, somewhere in the world, right? And they said, well, well it probably changes anyway, so we'll just build it like this now, and we'll create it more fancy as soon as it hits the street, right? And not now. So um, that works. So a bit about the Agile project. So this was basically the tool set we had. Now, if you look at Agile tooling, or whatever it might be, it is usually tools for the Agile project manager. It's usually not the tools for us, the developers. But the thing is, if you look at Scrum, this is part of the Scrum guide. The word project manager is not there, right? So they have to think about how to keep themselves busy in our projects. And they do that. And there's lots of tooling out there. And usually companies who ask me, so what tools should we use? They've already investigated this stuff. And they found all of these fancy tools. I'll show you a few of them. Like, oh, this, this is, I took an arbitrary number of tools and I just looked at what they, what they promised, actually. So here's one that says a good fit for anyone and everyone. Sounds deep, right? And it says, finally, an agile management tool, all teams can share whether Scrum savvy or not. So this is the final solution, right? This is the silver bullet. Well, there's another tool. Oh, this, this, and they always have these like street girls, these, um, I don't know. He's not really pretty, but, but well, <laughs> well, developers in general, oh, well, let's not talk about that. Anyway, so. <laughs> So there's always these videos of, 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 of credible people explaining why you should use this tool. It's a way to create street credibility for, for these tools. So Jira as well. Go Agile with ease. So if you use Jira, it becomes more easier, right? But unfortunately, there's other tools that make it even easier. <laughs> so which one should you choose? Or the most intuitive Scrum tool you've ever tried? Well, I haven't tried any, but... Um, um, and it's called Scrum Wise. And it uses the most ugly font there is in the world. Comic Sans and then Italic, which is the worst you can get, right? So. And then there's this other one that says, the number one Scrum software. What do you mean the number one? I thought this one was the most intuitive. But only oh, this one is the number Scrum, one Scrum software, right? Um, built better software. So you have. How do you build better software? By using a dashboard. It tracks what you're doing. That's it, right? It doesn't help you build better software. It's just what it do. So what should this Agile tooling do? Again, this is my team, right? See, this is the meeting where we're uh, almost all of us together. We don't even fit in the room when we're all together, right? So we split it up. That was a good thing to do. Um, so this gives a good sum up of what it's you. If you have a tool for an Agile project manager, but I think they could basically stick with Excel for quite a while. It works really well. 
is help you prioritize and plan, monitor the progress. I think that, that's a cool thing for online dashboards. Uh, and, and, and keep in track of that. And I don't know about this one, set deadlines. I'm not really sure about this one. Don't do that, actually. So if you visualize this stuff, this is what a lot of people still do. This is terrible. I think, wow, this, this, this is a Scrum dashboard. It is. Scrum dashboards are terrible. The reason for that is plainly simple. It is, it doesn't show where you are in the process. Now, I'm not saying have this rigor process. I'm saying it doesn't show, right? Usually, if you look at these boards, I've seen quite a few of them. So here's stuff on to do, stuff in done. But usually, most of it is in here. So let's say all of these little, I don't know what shape they are anyway, but let, let's suppose they're halfway during the sprint. And all this stuff is in, in progress. So what does that mean where you stand? It's all in progress. So it doesn't have, you don't know whether they're testing it, whether they're building it, whether they're, I don't know, sending, shipping it off to some third party vendor or whatever they do. So you don't see the progress. So my personal recommendation would be try to visualize your workflow, your work item workflow, which is basically what Kanban says, right? It says visualize your workflow. That means visualize sort of the steps that you have in, in, in um, implementing your work items. And that actually helps a lot in tracking where you are, and especially tracking where the issues are on that life cycle. So, um, well, this isn't really a clear example. So here you could say, because this is all new, so this one uses um, a common called in preparation, in iteration. So this is all the stuff they need to do in the current sprint. Um, uh, this, are, this is the stuff they're working on, which basically means developing. They do developer testing. Testing, there's nothing in testing, so that's good for the tester. And this is acceptance testing, which the client does, and it then it goes to accept. You can have your own life cycle for doing this. Uh, my recommendation would be, if you do this, so this is one from my current project. Um, and, and this is a new one, because we, we've moved to smaller teams now. This, so this, we now have four of these. Um, and they have a life cycle as well. It has a number of steps. But the life cycle is different from project to project, and even from types of work items. So the good thing about it is, is that you can track where the issues are. I wanted to say something else about it. Um, hmm. Sort of slipped my mind. That's a long day. Um, it's been a long night as well. Anyway, so, <laughs> so it, it helps you visualize the stuff. And, and um, um, no, I, I wanted to say something useful finally, but um, <laughs> oh yeah, that's fun. So you, you can use it like this, and, uh, but you can do it like this as well, as long as you take the steps in there. Right? Um, Damn, I wish I could find it back. Well, I forgot. You can also overdo it. <laughs> this is coming from uh, one of our lean offices at Capgemini. They have made dashboarding an art. Right? <laughs> They've created, for every project, they created like 40 different dashboards. Right? And there's people just creating all these dashboards. I mean, it's, it's all fun, but I, there's no visibility anymore. Right? It's too much. So don't overdo this stuff. Right? Um, and they use this stuff. So it's, this is a, 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 an online video conferencing where people are, I think, probably in India, um, and they have the dashboard on the side, and there's another one as well. So they basically put up a, created a dashboard that they also see on the other side, and that from both sides you can actually manipulate the dashboard while on a meeting. That's an interesting way of doing distributed project. It helps to sort of improve on the communication between the different teams. And you have burned up charge in most of these teams, or burned down charge if you like, um, and, and there's, most of them do stuff like this. So. Uh, I'm unable to say, please use this one, because this is the best one. The best one for me is still have a, oh, well, have a paper board on the wall, put up your post-its on it. As long as you can do that, stick with it. Right. Don't start using these electronic boards just because you can, just because you have found the free trial or the free day trial that you get out for free and you're stuck with it afterwards. Keep with the paper ones. Now, as opposed to the agile hippies that I mentioned earlier, there's also something which I call the agile suits. And the thing is, there's money to make an agile. Companies have found that out. It used to be sort of this community of people who wanted to build better software, but there's companies that make money out of it. And if you look at this tooling that's out there, for most of the tooling in most of the areas in agile, um, you can get this 60 days free trial and then only after that you realize that you're stuck with a tool and you're going to have to pay for it. Most of them have some payment scheme. There are some free tools. There's even some open source that you can download and use it. But uh, most of them have something, some 
pricing schedule on it. So people want to make money out of it. It's not, they're not in this field for charity, right? It's companies that built these tools. It's companies that have to make money out of it, right? And there's different strategies for that. It's either you try to find something called street credibility. Atlassian is a good example of that. Other than that, or you do it through the boardroom. And lots of companies do that too, by the way. Um, so the, the CEO of the company I now work for, occasionally comes to me and says, well, I've had a visit from this and this company, and they, they're thinking of, they, they think we need this particular tool. And he has that about once a month, right? There's companies jumping into his office, wanting to sell him stuff for our agile projects. And I'm hoping that he continually says, says no to them, right? Because we don't need it. It's an, and he, well, he can make all decisions on buying stuff, of course, but um, I hope he still says no. So there's people dealing with the street curve, really. Atlassian is a very good example. They show you funny movies of how to do distributed version control system. They're actually quite good. How to do pair programming stuff. And they hope to get in through the developers. Right? So if the developers look at these things, oh, they said, they're funny. We're going to have to use their tools. It actually works a bit like it. But this is, of course, the short version of the story. It takes a while, but people love Jira, well, basically because they're a fun company. right? It's not a good argument, but it, it's done. And they did that really smart. Um, um, but still, there's still pricing here as well, right? It's, it's, it isn't always that cheap as you might think it is, right? It, it costs money. Now, if you're a big company, like an insurance company I work for, they have loads of money, <coughs> they could actually pay for this, they have it on board already. Um, and the other way is, um, what this other company is doing, interesting company as well, um, they jump on the bandwagon, of course, and they have loads of tools, right? Uh, basically called the, the Jazz Platform. Um, and what's all in there? Oh, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff of which I think, do I really need this in an agile project? Like rational quality manager, rational requirements composer, rational asset manager, rational rhapsody and rational software architect design management. I can't even pronounce it without breathing. But that's all. Um, uh, lots of stuff in there. And I tried to really look for pricing on the website of IBM. It took me like an hour before I could literally find where the prices were. Um, and there's lots more stuff they have, like um, clear case, clear glass doors, uh, um, well, lots of this stuff which I even don't know what is. Requisite Pro, of course, Software Architect, Software Architect for WebSphere, Software Lots. You don't need all this stuff in an agile project, guys. Especially if you work in a big company and these guys come in through the boardroom, please make sure that your CEOs stay out of touch with these kinds of sales because they'll buy you tools before you know it. There was a company I worked for as a client uh, um, uh, last year, really, really big international company. Um, uh, and they came up to me and said, yeah, yeah, we should really now decide on a tool. And the teams all want to use Jira, but we've just bought some licenses of IBM software. He said, um, how much? He said, well, um, we bought a million euros worth of licenses. Because it seemed useful and now this whole company is stuck with this, with this huge <coughs> collection of tooling of which they haven't got a clue to what to do with. So it's not always a good way to go through the board. Right? So here's the pricing. It's really expensive stuff. It took me really a while to find this page. Yeah, it's an interesting exercise. Go to the IBM website. Try to find out what the pricing is. <laughs> uh, is anybody here working for IBM? More? <laughs> I usually don't care. Right? So usually, if you want to jump into somebody's tool set, you have something which is called a vendor lock-in. You get locked into their tools. If you start using a particular electronic dashboard, um, and you've used it for a while, maybe in the free version, and move on to the paid version, um, you're stuck with it. It is very hard to get out. Um, so if you start using this stuff, wait as long as possible before you start using these paid off services that there are out there. Um, and only if you really, really need that, then you move on to electronic dashboards, right? So back to Agile again. So for the last part, Agile is all about collaboration. It is not about tool A, B, C, or D. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have tools in there for doing stand-up meetings. Cool, right? Cool technique. Not really, not really important, but it, it works quite well. Um, or doing design. In this particular case, we're just editing a Word document. It works fine in this project. I don't like doing requirements in Word, but they, that's the tool they use. OK, we'll deal with that. And it worked. Um, tools for development, for testing, et cetera, et cetera, acceptance, and even for evaluation. It's all, as you can see from the pictures, it is about collaboration. 
any tool that does the job to get you guys collaborating. And in my current team, that, is, that was a tough job to get them all to work together. It's good, right? Because it's basically the team that does the job. It is not the tools. Tools are okay, but the Yakni principle, you aren't going to need it. So only use it when you really, really need it. It's very valid for any tool in any area. Few of them are really managed, like a development tool, like a source control, stuff like that. And, and almost everything else, you can add on top of what you're doing. And it adds more ceremony to the project. Um, so to wrap it up, oh, this is what I was saying already. Um, Agile, actually, there is no such thing as the ideal tool set for all projects. It's different from project to project. You have to choose for yourself what are useful tools for your project. And please start minimal, start at the bottom. And only if you need to add more ceremony to it, only then please do add the ceremony. So, um, uh, oh, well, it's the same recommendation. Start with the 3M suite, which is the best suite still around. Get some markers. Um, by the way, if you also have uh, whiteboards in the room, we use a lot of whiteboards to do drawings, etc. I love drawing on whiteboards, it's really great. But if you use markers for uh, writing down your post its put them in a different location and then <laughs> markers for your whiteboard, because you will ruin your whiteboard within a couple of weeks, right? Um, so the best thing to do is, if you can't make a difference, only use whiteboard markers. Get rid of the permanent markers anyway. Just a small tip. Doesn't really have value, but it's a good tip. Um, so that's it. And, and the thing is, this is basically the last thing I'll probably say is that, I'll probably not because I talk too much anyway. But um, So getting there, getting finding the ideal tool set, it takes time, it, it takes change. For instance, the current problem we have at my team is that we need to set up the, the, the pipeline because we're doing a microservices architecture. We need to set up the deployment pipeline really, really fast. It's, it's high urgency. We haven't decided on what tool to use that. So that's the point in time that we definitely need to do that. Why? Well, we, can, we need it now. So we need a tool set for that now. Um, and we have to learn. Maybe we, we picked the wrong one. You, it, you can, you can do that. It's okay to make mistakes in these things, right? You learn from that. Actually, you learn a lot more from making the mistakes than learning from not making mistakes at all. So you don't have to choose the, the right one right away. Start with one, take it slow, small steps, and then add up to it. And if the tool doesn't work, change it. So we, we got rid of most of the fitness stuff, and I'm moving back to SOAP UI for testing service, etc., etc. So, so if you have any additional questions, remarks, or whatsoever, um, don't hesitate to ask them. I'll be easy to reach afterwards through this email address and through my um, Twitter tag. Um, and apart from that, thank you for being here. Don't forget to fill in the, the, uh, the app because they actually use that app to improve the next edition of Software Architect. Um, and well, thank you for indulging me for one and a half hours again. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of the conference. Thank you.